it was like a cesspool inside that place. It was messy, but again, that was its charm. Hey, my name's Kay Anderson, and you are listening to Lost Spaces, the podcast that mourns the death of queer nightlife. Every episode, I talk to a different person about a venue from their past, the memories that they created there, and the people that they used to know. Okay, so time to be totally honest with me. Have you ever hooked up with a work colleague? Or, actually, probably the question that I am more interested in is, have you ever known about a workplace hookup that hasn't ended catastrophically in a pile on the ground? Well, if you haven't guessed already by the way I just framed those questions, this week we are finding out all about a doomed hookup that our guest, Twitch streamer extraordinaire BB Kyle, had when he was working at Spin, a bar in Chicago's queer neighborhood, Boys Town. But that is definitely not all that we talk about. Though he is now based in Tennessee, BB Kyle or Kyle, as I'm going to call him from now on because BB Kyle sounds a bit weird in my mouth, says that he loved his time at Spin so much that he would still be working there today if it hadn't closed. Which means it must be a pretty special bar, right? We talk all about how he ended up in Chicago, what queer spaces offer that other spaces just don't, and sorry about it, it's just a fact, and how being forced to wear a uniform of nothing but booty shorts somehow helped Kyle learn how to love himself. And yes, reading that back, I realize how ridiculous that sounds, but I promise I didn't make it up. He did tell me that. Let's get into it so we can find out more. spent multiple years after high school just going to these weird underground parties like in Algonquin, Illinois. Um, Ooh, say it again. Algonquin. Algonquin. Yeah, it was like this weird, gross house. I hate to like say it like this, but like we call them like pedophile parties because there was like all these like older like (sighs) gay guys that would just like have like a bunch of like 16 17 year olds just partying with them getting wasted but it was never but, like, and how old were they i i don't even know they could have been literally 19 and i would have considered them a pedophile at that point just because like <laughs> you know i don't know <laughs> but they had a house and they were a really great place i thought i fell to secretly mingle because i wasn't really like out of the closet Mm -hmm. and I was kind of like starting to meet all these gay people and whatever and wait 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 sorry I'm sorry (laughs) I know this isn't the point of your story we're gonna get to the point of your story (gasps) so these older Mm -hmm. men lived in some house and had house parties first of all I just want to make an observation that like I had similar situations when I was young and didn't think anything of it. And now I'm like, why would anyone want to spend time with a 16 year old? That's just so strange. Yeah, I try not to think about that part. <laughs> <laughs> don't linger on it. Don't linger on it too I'll much. put it this way. I never hooked up with any of them. I don't know that they were even hooking up with people at all. Mm, Obviously, they probably yeah. were. I'm just like, I. it's not fair you for me to speculate yeah, yeah well because i was just like <laughs> I, I don't know how i that was 17 year old like selfish little yeah. like kid all i'm thinking about is like how much attention am i getting in this space and probably yeah, not even yeah. that much i mean it was just like a weird grungy gross place but i loved going there every single weekend so that brings me then to my second question How does a 16-year-old who is in the closet find out about this grungy, weird house where there are parties full of gay people? Yeah, so I just had this one friend in high school where we, like, decided to come out to each other, Mm -hmm. kind of in the tail end of high school. And I just started going with her, essentially. And 
I don't know why I never asked any questions. It seems like such a valid thing to do. <laughs> but I was just like so excited to finally meet another gay person. And I think like that's where some hetero people don't really understand why gay people tend to be a little bit more okay about like age differences is because like straight people exclude yeah, us yeah. from so many things that our only opportunity to feel safe and be around another gay person easily is by going to these things like these parties fortunately nothing ever bad happened while i was there but it's because of straight people that those have to exist. So, like, straight yeah, people yeah. acting like groomers, blah, 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 this. First of all, you're causing this problem. You're causing kids to have to reach out to possibly sketchy, shady adults with nefarious whatever by you not being a decent human being to these young gay kids. Yeah, and to be totally fair to these old pedophile <laughs> House people <laughs> probably shouldn't have started it that way. For, to these older people, yeah. they probably recognized that you felt lots of the things that they felt when they were coming totally. out and they were offering solace and support yeah. and maybe looking at you inappropriately. I'll put it this way. The the guys that run and ran it, I don't, th I don't think they're even together or anything anymore. But those guys that took care of that whole thing, they ran a pretty uh, a tight ship. They had paid security and things there and everything. So wait, but at, at a house? I mean, mind you, the paid security what? was just like some dumb frat <laughs> bros that they gave like fifty bucks to do it. It was like a, they had a private property and everything and parking in what? their own parking, like gigantic. I don't even know. This place was. Uh, so, so it's like a nightclub, but it was in a house. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm going to stop asking follow-up yeah. questions at this point. Let's, this story now is how you got to Chicago, and this was the setup, yeah. and I've taken us off on a weird <laughs> path. So get back to that. Go. Um, I was working at an Ulta. And Ooh, what's that? Ulta is just like this makeup store in... Um, okay. It, yeah, just all over the world. Okay. And I was working at an Ulta because I, I really thought that I wanted to get into makeup and things like that. But uh -huh. the I decided to start working at Spin in Chicago because one of my old friends from those parties that I was just talking about that I made there was working at Spin as a security ah. manager or something like that. Maybe they were just security. I can't even remember at this point. But they invited me to work there, and I was all about it. I was like, yes. And then I was like, afraid to make the jump to go there. So I stayed working at Ulta in Naperville while working in Chicago at the same time. And then finally, I kind of just like made the decision to give it a go, and I wanted to go to DePaul um, Which is a university. Yes. I'm so okay. sorry. I keep making these like, assumed <laughs> contexts that you're just going to know exactly what I'm talking yeah. about. So, so sorry. We, yeah. So we need to have a quick geography lesson. Mm -hmm. So where the altar was yep. in Nap N Naperville. Naperville. <laughs> and then Spin was in Chicago. Yes. How, like, what, tell us about the distance. Yes. How, long, how far away. So in like Illinois, Naperville is famous for being all these like rich kids that are not from Chicago. We'll just put it that way. When people in Chicago are making fun of out-of-towners, they'll be like, uh-oh, they're from Naperville. Um, I'm not from Naperville. I just want to clarify. I just worked at the Alta <laughs> in Naperville. But it's about 45 minutes driving to get from like Naperville okay. to maybe Boys Town. And so where did you live before you went to Chicago? I lived very close to there because I went to okay. a Catholic school out, out there you know, basically same okay. distance. Naperville and, and my town. So I don't want to like just like randomly yeah. say it. Kyle Town. <laughs> right. <laughs> I got doxxed the other day while I was streaming. Like somebody's like putting my personal information out there. It was like oh, wild. Shit. Yeah. My friend shit. got the worst brunch of it, but it's interesting that people even do that. Normally I wouldn't care. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> so, uh, and so that was the impetus for you to be like, uh-huh, I'm going to move to Chicago. Yeah, I was wanting to go to DePaul. I had actually already gotten accepted into DePaul. And spin would have been a really great part-time job for me. And I, I'm like not even kidding. Like a week after I got my apartment in Chicago, my dad called me 
to tell me that there was like something going on with his company and that they could not afford to pay for me to go to college anymore. And Aww. I know it was so disappointing, but then I had to, uh, I don't know why I just rolled with the punches with it. And I was like, Oh, okay. Mm. And I just told spin that I needed to become a full-time worker. And I started working full-time at spin with absolutely no problem. When I, especially when I first started, they wow. really liked me. It was a definitely one of the, more memorable. So, okay, so I'm picking up something there. You said definitely when I first started, I liked me more, which means that maybe that changed. But we will find out about that soon. So my next question is around being from somewhere that's close to Chicago, but not being in Chicago. Was it always the plan when you were a kid to be like, move to the big city yes fully because i knew i was gay since i think i recognized it in like sixth grade i accepted it about myself in the eighth grade and so wait 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 so wait sorry i'm cutting you off a lot today no go for the it sixth grade the recognizing it in yourself mm -hmm. what does that mean i and I, I say sixth grade is kind of like a guess it was like fifth or sixth grade and that just means that i was watching a lot a porn <gasps> and looking at the guys and being okay. like, next time I'm gonna look at the girl, I swear. Oh, <laughs> and God. then not even enjoying the porn, just beating yourself up about right? it. Right, I know that's the Catholic upbringing. I'm telling you, so I'm like very anti Ugh. anti religion. So wait, okay, so you were watching porn in fifth grade, which is like what, eleven, twelve? Oh, I don't know, maybe, probably. Shit, that is young. Okay, back onto track. So eighth grade, you recognized it in yourself. And the original question that we were going to before I've taken us off on this is that about moving to Chicago. I'm glad that you are able to recognize those <laughs> things and remember because I have like bad ADHD. I'm like, I would just totally forget what that original question was oh. every single time. And I took my Adderall today just for you too, just in case. Just for me. And <laughs> um, but I always knew that I needed to be in a space where I could be freely and openly gay mm -hmm. because I was mm -hmm. extremely shy in high school maybe up until my like sophomore year and I decided I wanted to stop being shy. And then I just like snap of a finger just became like very outgoing, but you know, there's still work to be done. And I'm just such a loud opinionated, not give a fuck person. I needed to be somewhere where I could be myself spin though. I will say like it destroyed me when it comes to like knowing what's like appropriate because I do this. I finally get to the city. I'm working at Spin and I'm working at uh, the shit showest of shit show bars where that those like little dirty underground like parties in Algonquin. That was what Spin was minus like the children being able to interact with adults thing. <laughs> but like it was just a place where people got shit face wasted they partied all of the bartenders and staff are wearing nothing more than maybe a underwear or booty shorts it was just a, a wild wild place and it grew it helped me grow really thick skin staff is always a bit rude people had the confidence to say anything that they felt to your face they kind of like destroyed my ability to discern what is like an appropriate thing to say <laughs> or do in public <laughs> for a while. You know, I, uh, I've definitely gotten better, but uh, it, she got sassy, you know. <laughs> okay. And so I want to, you keep bringing up spin and like this show is about lost spaces and I'm like, no, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about other things. So we will get to spin. <laughs> but I want to pick want. up on one of the things that you said about when you got to sophomore year, I think you said sophomore year, yeah. where you became snap of a finger outgoing. Yeah. From my experience, something something kind of similar happened to me where I was like, no, I'm going to be confident from now on. I'm going to be outgoing. Mm -hmm. But after a while, I realized, oh, yeah, no, that's not me. And everything felt very forced and very, like, fake and very, mm -hmm. like inauthentic and I just felt really obnoxious and gross yeah. how did you <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> it's like I'm insinuating that these are all characteristics I'm picking up in you that's not what I'm going to say yeah like how does that work how do you go from being shy to being 
outgoing. I wish I had a better explanation for it so I could like tell people to replicate it. I don't know. It really was an overnight thing. The, uh, the only thing that was holding me back from being like that was homophobia. You know, because mm-hmm. I was that inside. The only thing that was stopping me from being, I, I guess, open and outgoing was the fear of being caught, I think. I think I was always just nervous that if I spoke up, that people wouldn't be interested in anything that I was saying Mm. or doing or anything like that, even though I had a lot of opinions. But even like, not even the opinion that's coming out of your mouth, Mm. just the way you talk, Mm. right? Like I learned really early on not to speak because people were like, uh, you sound a bit faggy. Yeah. Ugh, you sound like a girl. And so I just learned to just not say anything ever and try and like not move and try and like <laughs> not do anything yeah. because people would have some sort of opinion about it. You know, it's really funny. So I went to Catholic school my entire life, but there was one mm-hmm. semester that I went to this school called Jane Addams. And that was the first time I realized that people saw me as gay because Mm. the Catholic school that I went to kindergarten through eighth grade, I was just like everybody else. Like, don't get me wrong. Like I still was like more friends with like the girls and things Mm -hmm. like that. But I always had guy friends and I always played sports growing up. But when I went to this like middle school for that one semester, I went in eighth grade, I was severely bullied beyond comprehension and constantly Mm. called a fag, constantly being called gay as a slur. (laughs) It was Mm. mind boggling to me. And that was just like a horrible experience. And I think I actually went from outgoing to shy because of that experience. Ah. Um, but And do you think that's because it, when you were in the earlier years, you were with a group of people that you'd always been with, mm-hmm. so they just accepted you because you'd always been that way, and then you were with new people, or is there other well, reasons? And I hate like, to give those early people too much credit by saying that they accepted me, <laughs> because like the reality <laughs> is, is a lot of them probably were homophobic. You know, If they didn't accept that, they just didn't notice because they grew up with me. Okay. You know what okay. I mean? Like, nobody Nobody notices. It's a distinction. Right. So I felt like when I went to that like middle school, I didn't even like realize. I didn't even realize how gay I was acting until so many people there tried to Mm -hmm. to point it out. And I got no support from like the teachers either. There's a surprise. But anyway, that made me (laughs) painfully insecure to be gay in public. (laughs) Yeah. But then so how do you just like overcome that? After being shy and hating the fact that I always knew I had a lot to say, Mm -hmm. the way that I overcame it, I don't know. It wasn't that I was trying to come out of my shell, but I think I just really wanted to have people around me that actually liked me for me. And so I was like, I'm just going to say whatever comes off the top of my head and just say it. I'm not even going to think. I'm just going to say whatever I feel like saying whenever I feel like saying it. And the people that like me are going to be the people that I love. And the people that don't like me, good. I got them out of the way. Uh, Yeah, and I think that's a really good way of looking at things. But it's also a lot harder than just that, right? (laughs) Yeah. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, it wasn't like a perfect process, right? It's not like I Mm -hmm. had that realization and then all of a sudden was just like going to every party and everything like that. And I think that I am an opinionated person and I think that I have sometimes creative opinions that maybe not the average person has. And so I think it becomes very easy for people to engage with me. And plus, I'm also a naturally curious person about other people. So I like to Mm -hmm. ask people a lot about themselves, too. So I've never met somebody that I struggled to be friends with. And if I've Ah. ever struggled, it's usually a them problem. (laughs) Oh, wow. Wow. Well, I can't say the same. Anyway, (laughs) so Chicago, you got there at 21. The question was around, like, what did it feel like to actually be there 
It felt great. It felt easily like that's where I belonged. Um, I, I came in there knowing some of the people that I had met at those like underage parties. At the pedo party. We can call the them the pedo, pedo parties. The pedo fine. parties, yay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of came there slightly knowing a person here and there that I had like, you know, met from there. Obviously, Chicago is so big yeah. and I didn't know that many people yet. But I get there and I kind of built this relationship with this one bartender that was the daytime bartender. I would go. Okay, wait, 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 wait. We're jumping ahead. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I'm what gonna am get I bossy going? now. Yes, go so, for it. So you got there. Really exciting to be there, mm -hmm. and you'd already got this job lined up at Spin, mm -hmm. which you described as the shit showest of shit show bars. Mm -hmm. So just to paint the picture for people who are listening, do you remember your first shift? I can't say that I like remember the first shift exactly, but I remember my mentality going into my first shift. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I interviewed for the position. And when I say that I was like coming out of being shy, the, the uniform for this position is booty shorts and that's all you know and for anyone who's not familiar with a booty short <laughs> what, what does that look like so they're like those like 70s <laughs> women's running shorts mm -hmm. um but they're kind of like hot pants but not yes basically like okay. very 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 short shorts essentially mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. mind you like when i was a little kid i used to cry if they tried to put me on the skins team when they would choose shirts and skins when we're playing like basketball or something like that. I, Wait, I is was... that a real thing? It's not just in TV shows. Well, I don't know if it's like something that is done anymore, like in today's day and age. But like when I was little, it was. But so shirts and skins is like one team has their top off and one team has their top on. Yeah. Oh, it's just wild. I know. Just, imagine doing that to a kid. And, but you want to know what's so crazy is and I credit spin with like a lot of things, but mm -hmm. it's crazy to me that I was so insecure about being skinny that I was afraid to take off my shirt. I don't know. It's just oh, so wow. wild to me to think that that bothered me so much today mm. because working at spin and being forced to do it that day. And I was like, okay, I just like need to get over this and whatever. And then being admired for being like, a genre of gay that people like it like and what genre is that <laughs> like I, I twink at the time at least not an aging oh, twink okay. necessarily anymore oh so you don't identify as a pocket gay no no oh. i don't know pocket gay to me it's not it's like sidekicky to me i wonder how big the venn diagram between twinks and pocket gays is well what is a pocket gay i thought it was just like a short gay and you're short. Yeah. And you're a gay. Yeah. I guess like a, a tater twink, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, okay. And then my follow-up question then, and we will get back to spin soon. Have you ever considered identifying as a twunk? No, I don't know. Okay, I've been thinking about it a lot recently because mm -hmm. they're like, what does a mm -hmm. twink turn into when they've aged yeah. out of being a twink? And... I have no idea. Um, I'm a blouse. That's a feminine top. <laughs> oh, uh, is it? A blouse, you know, is literally a feminine top. Like, <laughs> Oh, a feminine top. Oh. oh, God, that took me a while to get. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's why, okay, so I really struggle on dating apps because I don't know how to portray myself in a way that I feel is accurate. <laughs> Um, what do you mean? I don't know how to describe... Like, people want mass daddy. They want femme twink. They want ottery, yeah. blah, 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 whatever. But I like to wear makeup, and I don't mm. always wear makeup. I like to play sports, mm -hmm. and I like to be in control in the bedroom but i like someone that is very 
domineering outside of the bedroom, but I also am like down to get in an argument. So that like domineering person has to be like willing to shut the fuck up the second I want to be the one that makes the decision. <laughs> so I don't know. It's it's I don't know how to describe myself in a way that will be what the person ends up meeting in person. So, okay, so it sounds to me that you just want it your own way all the time. Totally. Why don't you just say that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I try to, to, to bring it up that way if I can. But that's why I rarely ever hook up with somebody off of an app. I think I maybe hooked up with somebody off of Grinder one time and I dated him for like three months. And other than that, I have to meet people in person to like know that we're going to actually vibe before, you know, I could do anything with them. Mm, okay. So let's go back. You were saying that you thought that you had overcome your shyness and that you were outgoing, but then you got to spin and then they were like, here, you've got to put this on. And you were like, ah, carry on, go. So it was just really weird because I I had to go buy that uniform and then I had to go wear that uniform and they they didn't give you the uniform you had to buy it yeah that is so weird right there's laws about that but uh (laughs) (laughs) i decided to buy this like uniform it was like american apparel is basically where we kept getting it and it was like the little shorts and knee-high socks that were matching in color and if we wanted we could have like a sweatband on our arm or like a head if we if we wanted to wear those And anyway, so I was just like, (laughs) fuck it, I'm doing it. But it was so weird for me because, you know, I did it and people flirted with me. I don't know. It was just like I was just so hell bent in my head that me me, being like a skinny man is not okay. And it was just really interesting to see how that kind of turned around for me and that I realized that. Maybe I'm not attractive to everybody, but mm. I am attractive to some people. Aww. It was like a really nice realization. Because like, like I said, I grew up in Catholic schooling my entire life and everything like that. And so like the whole concept of all of that, like fucking the little chunkers I was growing up with, the like boys, they were taught to feel more secure about themselves than me as a skinny little boy. And okay, wait, hang on. As a I, chunker... I have to say, <laughs> <laughs> look, I'm not saying like that there's anything wrong. I'm like attracted to chunkers. I just mean like okay. <laughs> I, it, it's just crazy that there was like any standard out there. And it's not like I'm comparing to the the fit kid or, you know, whatever. It's that me and the people who I think were equal opposites were just being skinny was like the worst thing in the world and it was just odd to me but is that the case or was it just all in your head probably all in my head like i'm comfortable like admitting that but i i think maybe i tied it to a subconscious homophobia of like the skinniness was also something i needed to be insecure about for being gay you know Uh, oh he's so skinny and he's feminine blah 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 you know what i mean so maybe i didn't mm. compare it to that was the reason at the time but that was probably it. like i knew that i was skinny and i was feminine and i knew that this is like a feminine trait to them and that is why people are making fun of me for being skinny you know ah okay yeah and i learned i could embrace that aspect of myself like once I was like at spin and having to be undressed and it was like skinny and things like that and wearing makeup in public, there were, don't get me wrong, there's plenty of gay guys that were like, gross, don't talk to me, you're wearing eyeliner, faggot. But like there was <laughs> ones that were not like that. I'm sorry, I didn't know also. I'm laughing. <laughs> <laughs> you were like, yeah, that was me. I kicked you little faggots when I saw you on the street. <laughs> um, so, okay, my follow-up question is around how you respond to people flirting with you when you're on shift. So I don't mind it at all. I am of the perspective that that is kind of like what I signed up for. You know, I, I, people may like disagree with that in, in some aspects, but because, okay, mm. it, this, that's such a great question because it ties to so many ideas that I've had about spin as a whole. Spin was like notorious for having straight men working there. And it was very annoying to me 
because there would be like some that loathed being hit on. And Mm -hmm. in my perspective, one, I will be grateful to being hit on until the day that I die because the day people like stop hitting on you is the day you miss it. (laughs) And I am not going to like look my gift horse in the mouth. So I'm grateful if somebody's like hitting on me. And that doesn't mean that I'm saying that people get to aggressively hit on you and things like that, or Mm -hmm. do things that are like absurdly inappropriate. But if you're in a bar and you're working in your underwear. Wait, 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 wait. Technically, they were booty shorts. Well, and underwear. There was underwear days. Oh, really? Oh, <laughs> you know? Oh. Like jock straps? Um, sometimes there was jock straps, but there is actually laws against wearing jock straps in Chicago. Um, so wait, like, do, do, does the law state? <laughs> one mustn't wear jock strap. <laughs> no, it's like something to, I don't remember what it is exactly offhand, but it's something like you can't have under cheek or like under boob exposed while working behind a bar or something like that. <gasps> I mean, I get it with jock strap because of dingleberries, but under boob. I know. I don't know what the exact like reasoning is or whatever, but on our Friday nights, we would have a shower contest. And Mm -hmm. the bartenders that worked in the area of that would always have to wear a jock strap. But weirdly, they had to wear a towel on the back of their strap of their butt and then have it hanging over their exposed butt. So like, (laughs) so so what? It was like a jock strap with a cape. Yeah, essentially. Exactly. Good visual. Weird. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Blah, blah, blah. Flirting. Flirting. Yes. We're talking about flirting. It was nice to be flirted with. It's, I think it's nice to be flirted with. I mean, the best part about working at a bar is you have like three feet of wood in front of you that blocks you from whatever. Wood, yeah. You know? So <laughs> I just feel like I, it was easy to do it. I don't know. I enjoyed it. And I like talking to people. And one of my strengths as like an employee is I talked to every single person. And if some of them were flirting with me, even better. You know, I, I always thought of it as a good thing. Well, and so this thing you said about Spin being, I think you said notorious for having straight men working yeah. there. Mm-hmm. Is that a like an outdated view of the person hiring that like, oh, gay men love straight men. They'll be like magnets. Or is there another reason? I don't know. I've never really gotten like a firm understanding of it. It is something that I am personally very bitter about. But I also say that as somebody that loved basically every single straight coworker that I've ever had. Some of my best friends are straight. I know, right? Yeah, I just don't... (laughs) This is the reason for... I can speculate on why I think that they hired a bunch of straight people in the second, but my opinion about, like, why straight people shouldn't work in Boys Town is because they can work at any bar that they want and it be Mm -hmm. okay. Gay people need a space because I might not get hired at fucking buffalo wild wings because their managers mm. just some straight guy and we're like i'm not having some like a little femboy going up to these sports guys watching mm-hmm. their sports <laughs> but my one chance to be able to make money as a bartender is in this one little block of space in the entire city of chicago and you're taking that away you are yeah. taking that away and then not only that you're sitting there and you're taking gay money and taking it outside of the gay neighborhood and you are taking gay money from gay people who think that you're flirting with them too and you could not be less interested and all you want to do is take their money and take it out of this neighborhood and i feel like the straight people that work in boys town need to really be spending their time in Boys Town, like their time in Boys Town. Um, Mm -hmm. Even the ones that are doing that will never be doing enough. I feel like there's trans people that are struggling to get jobs. I mean, they're probably struggling even more so than every single demographic that Boys Town is even made for. And that's one job that like a trans person is not getting. We had so many straight bartenders that were the main, main, main bartenders. 
and it's crazy to think that so many queer people were working lesser positions to highlight straight people yeah. in Boys Town. I'm very bitter about that. Yeah. And there's a problem as well if they're coming mm. into that space and then feeling, and I think you insinuated this before, or no, you flat out said it, like feeling offended if someone flirts with them mm -hmm. when it's like, mm, what, like, huh? Crazy, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. They did a lot of really dumb, rude shit, but I think especially being bothered if like a weird old gay guy's ogling you from like the other mm. end of the bar like who cares be grateful yeah. like be grateful this person is staring at you all they're doing is staring yeah and that person's come there as a safe space away from this heterocentric world that mm -hmm. they've been submerged in for the rest of the week mm -hmm. and you're bringing all of this hetero bullshit to totally. the space like why the fuck can you not just mm -hmm. let it go and along with that because i got when i talk to like younger gays and stuff like that i try to like in even like me when I was like coming out as a person mm. and like seeing maybe like some older gays that were I like I'd be somewhere and they'd like do this like weird like creepy stare that like is like lingering for too long. I'm like people like don't understand what it was like to be gay 10 years ago. Like Gen Z doesn't understand what it was like to be gay the age of a millennial. Millennials don't understand what mm -hmm. it was like. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, people don't understand that that was like the only way to communicate you were gay to somebody <laughs> for a while. And that some mm -hmm. places cruising was the only option some people had. And I'm living in this like tiny town in Tennessee People are like that down here still mm. where it's like they are so terrified to be like around gay people like in just like a regular like social setting that they are doing everything in the most secretive like seedy way. And that is not a fault of these people. That is a fault of the society that has put them in a position where that is the only way that they're able to communicate with other people. So I'm mm. like these straight guys with like an old guy that is just like staring at them too long. I'm like, this man has suffered. Let him stare. <laughs> you know? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and like, do you want a tip or not? I mean, come uh, on. That too. That too. <laughs> you being rude to that older guy at the other bar, if I was the bar back, I'd be like, that is like a percentage of my profit. You better go and let that man flirt with you. <laughs> <laughs> so earlier you said they liked me at first. What did you do to piss him off? Well, okay, so I didn't mean to, like, <laughs> word it that way. I just, um, when I first got there, I was just, like, go, go, go. I don't know, like, like an insane person. Oh, no just stigmatizing super... language. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I was just, like, a, like, very energetic, very on top of my stuff. Um, I guess there was a positive association there. <laughs> I was just like really, really on top of everything and just very like a aggressively hard worker trying mm. to impress. With that 21 year old energy. Yeah. You know, I could never imagine doing that again today. I'm like, I don't know what I would do, <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, I became such a staple there and probably an arrogant little like piece of shit that I would just like I messed with people a lot, you know, and I'm a different person today, but still very similar. But I think I just like poke at people and like, you know, a little bit of a troll. I'm a child of reality television. It's taken a lot to grow out Sounding of it. A little vague to me. Well, I don't know how to like give like a great perfect example. I would like I'd love to I, like give one, but I'm like a Why living don't we troll. Try a few out. <laughs> to a few examples. I'll tell you. Let you know if it's good enough. Okay, so like being working at Spim, I was introduced to uh, like the concept of like reading and throwing shade and stuff like that mm -hmm. and I have been a flaming faggot for a long time that I am used to being insulted constantly and I just got good 
at having comebacks and being able to just kind of be kind of trolly about it. And then the concept of like drag queen shade throwing and all that, I probably just like got a little too deep into it. Everything so was. like, here's the thing is I would be hard pressed to find one of my old coworkers that said that they didn't like me. Maybe they all didn't love me, but like most <laughs> everybody really liked me and got along with me. I mean, I don't think I'd, I have like any enemies of any of my coworkers, but I just mean like, uh, I think those same coworkers, even the ones that I'm still keeping like hardcore touch with like today, they'd be like, yeah, 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 you're definitely a more toned down version of who you were. So that's all I meant. I just meant like, it's like a love to hate him. Like kind of like a little brother type of situation okay. is I think how many of them would have seen me at the end of my experience. <laughs> <laughs> so like that annoying fly in the room. Yeah. They're like, God damn it. What is, what is he going to come over? He's going to say some the like, wild ass shit right now. Like that's like a, idea that I'm having. Oh, okay. So you didn't burn your bridges or anything? No, no. If Spin were still open today, I'd still be working there. I loved it, and I loved the people that I worked with so much. It was just such a, a, a mix of personalities that you would not be able to find anywhere else. Like, a sense of community that was just... You knew who the core people were that were the Spin family. And Spin closed, right? So we refused to give up on that place. You could see who was obviously there that just loved what we were doing and loved the, the seeing each other every single day. I, the day I found out it closed, I went out to this bar called The Call up in Andersonville. And I just remember like, I was probably with some coworkers that I didn't even really like that much. And I started like bawling my eyes out to them because I just couldn't believe it was all over. And it was just an era. It was an, it was an experience that I just wish that I would have been given time to prepare for mentally that it was like coming because we were all just kind of told as a surprise, like, by the way, bin is closed. It's not reopening. We're mailing you a check. <laughs> so what was the deal then? Why did that happen? So I can't pretend that it was a complete surprise, however. So we had seen that Spin was up for sale on like some random like real estate websites. But the thing is, though, is like mm -hmm. every bar is always on those websites. Like if somebody yeah. makes them an offer, they'll take it essentially. And so that was kind of what we were like led to believe because we weren't the only bar that was on stuff like that at the time. And to this day, many years later, those bars are still owned by the same owners. So we just like weren't really thinking about it. But, you know, like speakers would blow out and stuff like that and they wouldn't get replaced. And we're like, OK, mm. th this is starting to get a little bit sus. The money was starting to get substantially smaller than it had been. And the owner of Spin he owns a ton of real estate in Chicago and is like a straight man. And he never comes inside the bar. He had like a, a little like sidekick worker for him that would maybe once in a while come in to help out with something. But really, they had like almost no attachment to the bar and its actual mm. running or anything outside of owning it and then collecting the checks with the managers like the next day in the morning. Mm -hmm. So there was just not a lover of the bar industry running the bar, you know, not somebody that's like keeping up with trends and stuff like that. So I'm really surprised that Spin did so well without somebody that was like mm. that running it for as long as they did but uh, they've got an offer that they wanted and they apparently tricked some dumb ass other straight guy into <laughs> buying it and uh you know they ended up just selling it and it became like a whiskey trust in chloe's and uh sold to a, it was like a group of it was like two straight guys uh, what's a group of straight guys called <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. I know a group of gays is a gaggle, but uh, mm. it's a bunch of straights. A schooner? Mm. A schooner? Anyway, um, so, like, I know the venue kind of, like, subdivided and then became several venues and, like, mm. so it still existed. But for the purposes of this 
conversation, let's just like say, didn't exist anymore. What do you think Chicago lost when it lost spin? I think Boys Town lost a sense of its no holds barred party atmosphere. So one of the things Spin was famous for was their Dollar Drink Wednesdays. Uh, I think the title of the event was called What the Fuck Wednesdays. And drinks were a dollar. But this wasn't unique to Spin. Almost every Mm -hmm. single bar in Boys Town had a dollar drink night. And they all kind of like had like this, I don't know if it was a spoken or unspoken agreement where they each chose a different day. So Mm -hmm. Sunday through Thursday, you could go to another bar and get wasted for dollars, just a couple of dollars. And So you about to tell me that Chicago has now lost its drinking problem. (laughs) No, (laughs) Chicago will always be a mess. It's just Chicago. But it was just wild because, like, you could go out every single day of the week and it was always a party in Boys Town. But this could also just be, like, that's my memory of it for having just such a positive association. But, like, Mm -hmm. it was wildly, like, people crazy, like, throughout the whole strip all the time. There's no dollar drinks at all anymore. I think the closest is, like, a dollar beers at, like, Roscoe's on, like, a Sunday or something like that, which is, like, great you know good mm-hmm. for them that's that's great it's just not like as a whole like when you can get a vodka soda yes, you know yeah, whiskey yeah. diet it's just like felt like uh like boys town is like becoming more like a mall food court as opposed to Sanitized. like yeah you know this one owner is basically like bought multiple of the bars on the strip uh. it's come on like nobody has their own flavor anymore i mean i i don't want to diss it i just like it's disappointing to see an owner own multiple bars i'd rather these people all maybe own mm-hmm. one but you know that's just like yeah. you know that's not how capitalism works <laughs> there I, the grunginess in like the the wild aspect of uh you know the partying and everything is like what i really liked about boys town but that's not to say like what's going on with it now is not better in the direction it's supposed to be going <laughs> but you know yeah, straight yeah. people moving into the gay neighborhood and stuff like that and i don't know do you know there are just straight people everywhere I'm oh i know like, like can we have one thing all <laughs> over the place recently yeah so weird they didn't have any straight people in my day anyway sorry let's get back on topic <laughs> yes so when you were working there mm. Did anything unprofessional happen with customers? Oh my god! Yeah, all the time. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I mean, I don't know. I like. I don't think it's like. Um, I don't see it as like a bad thing. Well, you were working for tips. I know. Yeah, I don't know. It's because it, I. I don't want it to like seem like I'm like dissing the service industry. It's not the same. Spin was definitely its own brand. Like for example, like R- Roscoe's in Boys Town. You're not allowed to drink while you work there at all. Mm-hmm. They're very serious about it there. Spin didn't really care. You know, people have gotten fired for drinking while working at Spin. But, like, it was clear that they just fired somebody they didn't like for drinking Mm -hmm. because they did not give a shit when other people would be, like, in a blackout. So the way that Spin was and the reason that Spin was so magical was, like, you came to Spin to party with the bartenders the bartenders were the party the staff was the party they were part of the party that you came to enjoy and so Mm. i think a lot of bars that you go to it's like you're going there and the bartenders are like backgrounds to the party you're having with your friends but the bartenders and maybe this is also why Spin failed, you know, because the bartenders were just having too much fun. <laughs> but you know, I'm just saying that this is what I liked about it. But Spin was a party that everybody was involved in. The staff was involved in. And, uh, you know, there's several times like, I mean, I had hooked up with multiple people inside the bar while we were working. I, like there was like a time like, like me and my coworker were like, let's go. We went in the bathroom downstairs, laid a towel down. We're like, let's <laughs> <laughs> It's a wild oh, place. Oh, wow. So it wasn't just BJ's. It was like proper. Yeah. Wow. Where did you get the towel? <laughs> 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 uh, but so after you slept with this coworker, mm. was it just like, oh, yeah, back to normal? 
Oh no, it did, was not actually. Um, I'm trying to think if he's the only coworker I slept with, but he's just the only one that comes to mind because of how weird it did end up getting. <gasps> I still to this day don't understand what happened there, but you were terrible. No, he had like a, such a huge crush <laughs> on me. It was, he was telling people that we were dating, and I was like, "No, oh. we're not." And I'm like, "I don't know why you think that." And I thought, like, I couldn't make it more clear. But like, I think I was colder to him about it then than I would maybe be about it today. I really don't know what I would do differently. That there was a really oh, wait, wait, weird. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, so what happened? So you you hooked up, and you hooked mm. up once, or you hooked up more than once? We had hooked up more than once, definitely. Okay, yeah. and then he went around telling coworkers that you two were together. I so don't weird. like. Yeah, it is so weird. I so I don't know. The, he'd kind of like describe it as like we're like seeing where things go. But here's the thing about me and dating as a whole. I don't do it. So like in my head, it's like obvious that this was nothing. So uh -huh. I don't know what is going on in his head. And maybe I didn't need to be that bothered by the fact that he was like telling people that. But I mean, um, yeah. I don't know. I it got really weird. But I think the problem was is that it had happened multiple times. Is it would be like, hey, just so you know, like we just like hooked up randomly. Like we're cool. I'm gonna hook up with somebody else tomorrow, and he'd be like, yeah, 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 it's cool. And me, okay. And then so I thought like he understood. And then like maybe we'd like be out and about and like at a bar and like be buzz and. and enjoying our time and then we'd hook up like again and then like this whole thing would like happen all over again and, and then we might have moved in together right, right and then yeah we were, like, shopping for rings and it, then... the, <laughs> it, it like really kind of came to a head because at one point he said he was like trying to like off himself or whatever by like taking like too many pills trying to get me to get uh... him to come over and stuff like that and i was like I can't be the one that has you come over because if I do that, it makes this something that you can do to like whatever. So yeah. I called his friend and like had them go over to kind of like take care of him. And, uh, and they did. Fortunately, he was he ended up being fine, but like very sad moment. And I was like, all right, I can't like involve myself with this more because like if he's like having some problem like kind of emotionally and like the way that we were kind of exploring things together was not working in a way that like was yeah. helpful to him and so it's really sad because I really do kind of like love the kid and I'm, I'm really sad that like a little relationship mm. kind of ended mm. plus I was like a douchebag I don't even know why he liked me <laughs> I was just like a wild child and uh I don't know but sorry, I started this conversation asking about if you had sex with anyone in the bathroom, and here we are talking. I about know, this, like, oh no, difficult <laughs> relationship. It's all good. I'm like used to going off on tangents, but you know, it wasn't that bad. It was a really long time ago, though. I mean, I've a uh, yeah, you know, we've run into each okay. other like since and stuff like that. Is a good time. So, are there any more salubrious stories to share, or shall we move on? I mean, like, you know, if you want to just, like, hear about me, like, fucking with people on, like, the back corner and stuff like that, yeah. Oh. I mean, there's... On the dance floor? Well, yes, that definitely has happened. Uh, but, I mean, I don't know. I was there for four years. There's probably a million different times that I've, like, hooked up with people there. And, like, all of my coworkers were doing it. Like, anybody that says, like, they didn't do it. I know the manager. We had, like, a straight man and his girlfriend. His girlfriend was the manager. The straight guy was, like, bartending. And they would, like go and just like fuck on the office like the only office desk that they had on a regular oh. basis it was like a cesspool inside that place it was messy but again that was its charm <laughs> and that's why you loved it yes so then what did spin teach you about yourself oh one be less insecure about like having my clothes off which i really mm -hmm. appreciate you know it sounds like weird but like being so afraid to be looked at before and then being comfortable with being stared at was like kind of like an eye-opening experience when it comes to like that type of 
uh, comfort level and getting over that type of insecurity. And then it also taught me to have like really, really thick skin because like even like the, my coworkers were, were like, everybody is like a little bit shady and like uh, arrogant and a little bit like rude. But it's also like what I like about them because I like I admire that type of like confidence. Like, don't get me wrong. I don't admire assholery. But I mean, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. these are people that are just like so comfortable with themselves and so confident in themselves that they behave thinking only about being their natural selves. And I, I appreciate that. And people would say anything to your face. And not just my coworkers, but the customers also. Like customers thought that they had the right to comment about every single aspect of your personality, look, and everything. It would be so wild to me. Like, I, I don't know if I did something new with my style or something like that. They'd be like, you're more attractive, like, with this, blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, this wasn't for you specifically, you dumb idiot. Like, I, whatever. So, anyway, it just, it helped me kind of like grow some really thick skin in the variety of people that you get to meet while working in a bar, especially like a bar like Boy Sound. I think what people don't really understand about gay bars as a whole is that gay bars are usually sectioned in an area by themselves and people have to travel far and wide to come to it. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. a gay bar in Chicago is going to be different than a straight bar in Chicago. That straight bar is going to just have anybody that lives in that neighborhood. That's all coming to it. Any gay bar is going to have people from around the world coming to visit it. So you will always have a variety of people, a variety of personalities, a variety of walks of life, incomes, demographics, everything. And so I think like that is why, gay people are smarter and better than straight people is because they have more exposure (laughs) to variety. (laughs) Super quickly, if you loved hearing about Spin in today's episode and you want to hear more about that very venue, then why not listen to episode 53, way, 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 way back in the archives, where I got to talk to drag queen extraordinaire Alexis P. Bevels about her time working at Spin. And whilst you're listening to that, if you have any memories of Spin, if you have any memories of clubbing from your own queer scene, then why not get in touch? Drop me a little line and share some of your memories. I am intending to create the biggest online record of people's memories and stories of queer clubbing, but in order to do that, I need your help. Go to lostspacespodcast.com, find the section, share a lost space, and then tell me all about what you got up to. If you would prefer to reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, I am more than happy to talk to you there. My handle across all three is Lost Spaces Pod. And yeah, say hello. Find out more about BB Kyle by following him on Instagram, where his handle is bbkyle.twitch. Twitter, where his handle is Bad Gay Podcast, or on Twitch, which is like a thing where people stream video games and talk and stuff, and I don't really understand it, but if you do, then you should definitely go and find out about Kyle there, where his handle is BB Kyle. Or you can just visit his website, which is bbkyle.com, where you will find all of this information in a much more succinct manner. Hmm. If you enjoyed this episode, I would really, really appreciate if you took the time to subscribe, leave a review on your podcast platform, even if you're just leaving stars, make sure it's five, and or telling other people who you think might be interested in giving the show a little listen too. My name is Kay Anderson, and you have been listening to Lost Spaces. Lost Spaces.